Well, welcome everybody to this webinar, Reef Health and Climate Change Impacts in the Caribbean and Mesoamerican Reef Region. Today, we have the great opportunity to have this group of experts and practitioners sharing their findings and stories from different angles and geographies in the Caribbean region. I will introduce each one of them before their presentations. We will talk on the importance of climate change in the region and the need to strengthen monitoring efforts to continue developing a comprehensive understanding and a collaborative response to climate change impacts in the Caribbean. So we hope that through this event, you all can learn more about regional commitment policies addressing climate change, new technologies, and approaches to study and monitor climate change impacts on coral reefs. So uh, we are going to have two sets of speakers, uh, three presentations at the beginning, and then we have 15 minutes for questions and answers. And then the last two presenters, also with 15 minutes questions and answers at the very end. So for all the participants, thank you for joining from around the world. It's amazing we have people from India, Germany, and Bahamas all together. Um, you will see in the bottom of your screen a chat box. We don't have the usual question and answer box. So I will appreciate that from now on, you only type in any questions you have for each of the speaker. Please uh, write the name of the speaker you are directing to your question to. And also make sure that um, the chat box says the message to all, because if not, I will not be able to read them and I can miss your question, okay? Well, um, I think that's it for introduction. So we will start with Ileana Catalina Lopez. Ileana is the program officer responsible for the specially protected areas and wildlife soup program at the United Nations Environment Program Regional Seas for the Caribbean, Cartagena Convention in the Kingston Duty Station in Jamaica since April 2018. And she has also worked with the UN Environment as program officers at the Multilateral Environmental Agreements Unit, Law Division in Nairobi, Kenya, addressing biodiversity issues at the global, regional, and national level. Ileana's talk will focus on climate change on coral reefs for the Mesoamerican and the Caribbean region, highlighting UNEP's role to address climate change and the science policy interface for adaptation. And she will present a sports mandate and approach to respond to the challenges posed by climate change. Thank you, Ileana, and you can start. Uh, each presenter will have 10 minutes, and I will let you know when you are at eight minutes so you can start wrapping up your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Marisol. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good morning, everybody, and good evening for those of us uh, away from America. It's for me such a great pleasure to greet all participants from the different latitudes, and especially I wish to greet Healthy Reefs uh, colleagues. Uh, especially the Guatemala chapter, Ana Giro and Angela Mojica, for their kind invitation uh, for uh, my presentation. The presentation is on the climate change aspects for UN Environment, United Nations Environment Program works, specifically for coral reefs, and I'm going to try to make it as, as short as possible. Thank you. Uh, as you are aware, we have the Cartagena Convention in the wider Caribbean region with the purpose of promoting regional cooperation. Ileana, I will interrupt you because we are seeing your screen, but not full screen. If you can click in the top part in display settings. Yes, uh, sorry. At the very yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, sorry. Thank you so much and apologies for that. And uh, so the Cartagena Convention, as I was mentioning, aims to promote regional cooperation for the protection and development of the wider Caribbean region. And we believe in an integrated approach for sustainable development of marine and coastal ecosystems. Basically, it's an integrated management taking into account the different sectors that promotes economic growth and sustainable livelihoods. The Cartagena Convention is supported by three protocols, as you all know. 
the pollution from oil spills that was adopted in 1983, the specially protected areas and wildlife. Uh, I am the responsible program officer for this protocol. We work with the species, ma uh, marine protected areas, as well as with the, the ecosystem-based management approach. And uh, then this is land-based sources of pollution protocol that is supported by my colleague Chris Corbins. Uh, you have in the circles the amount of contracting parties that have ratified the instrument. In support of the SDGs, uh, the Cartagena Convention focus is basically in four, even though we go across the different sustainable development goals of the 2030 agenda. One is goal six, to support sustainable management of water. Goal 11, inclusive, inclusive cities, and we work with our colleagues from UN Habitat. Goal 13 is climate action, and goal 14 is life on the water. So generally, we belong to the United Nations Environment Program, and the United Nations Environment Program work to address climate change ab about uh, national priorities and try to find out what are the causes and impacts of climate change on the economy and human well-being. And for that, how it does it, addressing the impacts of climate change, developing strategies and public policies, and sometimes we implement pilot projects. Ilian, sorry, but we are still seeing uh, your screen divided. You have to click on the top. I'm sorry, but uh, hey. at this point, I mean, it's kind of, I don't know how to do it. I'm probably I'm going to get out of everything. Okay. Share the screen. So, I don't know, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I think that it's better to, to do what I was doing because now I can't share anything. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, uh, we are seeing your presentation now. Um, you can see it? Yes, just click on the presentation mode. Yes. Uh, there we go. Okay, sorry for that again. Um, these are the issues that I was referring to. Okay, so the United Nations Environment um, considers the coral reefs among the most valuable ecosystems on Earth, together with the mangroves and seagrass meadows. And you know there is an em environmental assembly where joins more than 190 countries from the world, and this is the UN Environmental Assembly, and they have decided that sustainable coral reefs management is one of the urgent needs to intensify our efforts to prevent degradation, conservation, and restoration of coral reefs. And of course, we work with marine protected areas. Basically, since I now I lost time, I will say that we work like in an integrated approach because, for example, if we don't address a weak governance, overfishing, pollution, and a habitat degradation, we won't be able to have a successful intervention for climate change. So basically this is like the integrated approach for climate change. You see, you work, we work with ocean acidification, sea level, level rise and coral beaching among others. A special program uh, works with a species according to its mandate. And uh, our objectives are to increase the number and improve the management of protected areas and managed areas in the wider Caribbean, including support to regional and regional conservation strategies and support the conservation of threatened and endangered species. We have annexes where species are uh, strictly uh, considered or are managed depending the decisions of contracting parties. And also we promote information exchange, training and assistance. For example, for species, what I am mentioning is for marine mammals, we have the regional marine mammal action plan. You see at the right all the different partners that we work and the, these plans are important mainly where the climate change is going to take a um, full place and we hope it doesn't, even though it's continuous. And we work with invasive species. For example, we have the regional lion fish strategy since 2014. And we address the issue of sargassum. Um, we have a regional working group and um, plan where we address these issues. We have a white paper to disseminate the importance of the scientific uh, aspects to address this issue. 
Same with fishing species for queen conch and lobster and turtles. But more specifically today for coral reefs, uh, we have a support and we share the Global Caribbean Regional Monitoring Network, the GCRMN, in cooperation with uh, this was under ICRI, and we go work with our colleagues here from Healthy Reefs Initiative, from Reef Check in Dominican Republic, and we have some projects, for example, Carib Coast, promoted by the U European Union. Um, we have the different scenarios for climate change, and we have a 2% increase. The coral community will expect a collapse of 99% and 1.5%, 70% to 90%. So this is a very critical situation. Over the last two years, we made a, a state of the habitats report where we're trying to see what are the different scenarios and situation in the wider Caribbean for corals. And after having the status and gaps, we came out with the creation of a regional strategy and action plan for the evaluation, protection, and restoration of key marine habitats, among them the coral reefs, seagrass beds, and as well as the mangroves. So um, also we support the regional strategy and action plan for the declaration of the United Nations General Assembly uh, for, um, the, for a restoration. So this, what is the score response to the climate change? So we, our approach is the nature, nature or ecosystem-based solutions to climate change. So there is an increasing emphasis on the opportunity to use marine and coastal ecosystem services for adaptation and mitigation mechanisms. And uh, this can drive for commitment for donors and action for uh, different stakeholders. So as I mentioned before, in the green box you see, we did the state of the habitats report, uh, report for the three habitats that I have mentioned. Then we came out with a regional strategy and action plan preparing cooperation with several stakeholders using as a framework the different international conventions, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity, the 2030 Agenda, the Samoa uh, Framework, the C SMS, CMS uh, uh, Biodiversity Convention, and Ramsar. So, and then this regional strategy and action plan for the evaluation and protection this, of this key habitat pretends to address key transboundary problems, because if something happens, for example, in Guatemala, I am Guatemalan, by the way, living in Jamaica, but if something happens in Guatemala that affects true pollution, Belize and Honduras, it doesn't make any sense because the protection efforts at national level will be affected for transboundary movements. So- You have two more minutes. Thank you. For coral reef uh, threats, uh, we focus basically in diseases. Uh, we are going to listen today to all the experts on global climate change. And we pretend, for example, this is one of the pillars from the regional strategy that I was mentioning before. So we try to improve ecosystems, health, biodiversity, and we protect habitat areas of ecological importance, support MPA management, reduce fragmentation, and manage coral diseases. And then this is in con consideration of the targets by the SDGs and the uh, Ramsar Convention, for example. And for the regional strategy, we also work with uh, promote and use green infrastructure and blue carbon, among others, conducting blue carbon stock inventories, pilot demonstrations, and practices and approaches. For that, we also work with marine protected areas that was uh, identified one of the most effective tools for the Aichi biodiversity targets, and we work with CAMPAM. You have probably heard that name. And with that, I would like to say thank you and apologies for not showing the full screen at the beginning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ileana. Well, now I'm going to present our next speaker, Mark Aiken and he has worked for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for over 25 years and directs Coral Reef Watch, a program that forecasts coral reef bleaching and other threats through satellite model and in water observations. He has contributed on two intergovernmental panel on climate change reports in the US and was chief scientific advisor for the film Chasing Coral winner of the Best U.S. Documentary Award at the 2017 Sundance Film Festival and the 2018 
Emmy for Outstanding Nature Documentary. Mark's talk will address climate change and coral bleaching. Are we approaching annual bleaching? Thank you, Mark, and you can start. We already see your screen. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, glad to be with all of you, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in terms of coral bleaching this year, and generally what to expect in the, uh, in the coming years. Um, just a, a quick reminder for those of you who, uh, um, let's see, are you seeing, it's not in presentation mode, is it? Can you push the button? Yeah, there we there go. There we go. Okay, perfect. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with coral bleaching, um, corals mostly get their food through photosynthesis from microscopic algae living inside their tissues that are called zooxanthellae. Uh, corals can bleach or expel these zooxanthellae into the water any time that they're stressed. But the biggest thing that causes coral bleaching is uh, exposure to high temperatures or high light. Um, corals that eject their algae appear bleached, and if the stress is mild or brief, the corals can recover, uh, but if it's prolonged, they die. Here you can see a close-up of a coral uh, that's partially bleached. And you can see the difference between those polyps on your left-hand side of the screen where you can actually see the zooxanthellae inside of the tissues as compared to these in the center where you can see that the, the tissues are clear and the zooxanthellae have all been ejected. When this happens, uh, it can make the coral sick, more vulnerable to uh, disease, and uh, large, spread, uh, large widespread bleaching events like we've been seeing in recent years uh, have caused severe damage to coral reefs around the world. At NOAA's Coral Reef Watch, what we do is we use a set of satellite uh, data to put together products to provide information on the threat of coral bleaching around the world. We start with these five kilometer sea surface temperatures from there, we build anomaly products that tell us how the uh, temperatures are uh, different right now from what they normally would be this time of year. But most importantly for corals, we have the products uh, that are coral specific, such as our coral bleaching hotspots. That tells you how much warmer the corals are than normal right now. The degree heating weeks add up those hotspots over time and give you an idea of the accumulated heat stress that the corals have uh, uh, been exposed to. And then we use our bleaching alert area uh, uh, product, which will provide information on a combination of both the hotspots and degree heating weeks and basically tell resource managers and others what it is that's most important to them. Are the uh, temperatures rising and there's a potential for bleaching and you have a, a watch or a warning? Or have you now reached the point at alert level one or alert level two where it's likely that you'll be seeing either uh, significant bleaching in your area or at alert level two, widespread bleaching and start to see coral mortality. So let's get into what it looks like right now. This is our regional virtual station um, uh, Google map interface from our website. Uh, you can go in there uh, right now from our homepage, you click on virtual stations, regional virtual stations. And what you'll see is that right now for the Caribbean, we already have at least bleaching watch conditions throughout uh, almost every point in the Caribbean. Uh, we have uh, bleaching warnings over wider areas, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, Western Caribbean region. Um, and then we have alert level one conditions that have just started cropping up in some sites off Nicaragua, um, uh, Belize, parts of Cuba, and the Bahamas. Uh, this is not unusual these days for them to be starting this early, but it does indicate that we have warming conditions and uh, the the bleaching is possible in some of these locations and likely to increase. So this product you're seeing is from our satellites. What we also do is we use climate models to provide information on the potential for coral bleaching up to four months in advance. Here you're looking at the global map and we currently are seeing that there is a continued threat for uh, bleaching conditions on both sides of, of India and the Northern uh, Indian Ocean uh, in the areas around Southeast Asia and the Philippines. 
We're expecting to have uh, bleaching conditions in the Western Pacific, uh, places like Guam and the Marianas, Micronesia, uh, could be seeing bleaching conditions. But we're also seeing this potential for bleaching across the Caribbean. Let's zoom in on the Caribbean, uh, since that's what we're here for today. And what you can see is that most Caribbean locations are likely to see alert level one conditions this summer. And you're likely to see alert level two in this band from Eastern Mexico across through the Yucatan, uh, Mesoamerican Barrier Reef, uh, around Cuba and Hispaniola. This could change. You know, while uh, this is what the uh, models are showing currently, keep an eye on this product because it will change through time as the models uh, get new information and are able to improve the predictions. One way you can keep track of what's going on across the Caribbean is through this uh, nice uh, newsletter that's put together uh, by our partners at the Karakoff program at CIMH in uh, Barbados. Uh, they take information from our website and on the, the front page provide information on uh, what the current conditions are, uh, some of the things that are going on around the world, as well as the current outlook and, and the, the outlook for the upcoming a uh, few months on a month by month basis. Uh, they issue this uh, on a, um, uh, issue this every month and uh, you can see the uh, URL for it at the bottom of the screen. Now the other thing that's going on is not only are we seeing this potential for bleaching now, but we're seeing it on top of what has been an increase in bleaching events over past decades. The animation you're seeing in front of you is from the third global bleaching event that happened from uh, 2014 through 2017. And of course, for those of you in the Caribbean, you saw bleaching in some parts of the Caribbean each or all of the years from 2014 to 2017. It was a time that caused a lot of damage to coral reefs around the world. And in fact, is, is the most widespread, most damaging, and certainly the longest uh, duration global bleaching event so far. The concern that this gives us is not just what happened in those three years, but this is only the third global bleaching event. There was one in 98, there was one in 2010, and now we had one that lasted for three years from 2014 to 2017. The potential is increasing that in fact, we'll be seeing temperatures rising and seeing these kind of bleaching events very regularly and perhaps every year in the near future. In our website, we have some new products that are about to be released. Uh, you're seeing a, a preview of some of these now. We have diagrams like this one uh, on the website that show uh, the last several years of uh, heat stress. The new version that's going up is going to have our entire new record that goes from 1985 to today and compares the current conditions against the last, uh, against the 10 warmest years on record. You can see right now, this is a, an example. I'm going to show uh, images for Belize. Um, the Belize Regional Virtual Station right now is at the warmest it's ever been this time of year. The heat stress, we're up to uh, over four, uh, about five degrees, uh, degree heating weeks. We're in alert level one conditions and it's rising. So far, the heat stress is the ho second highest it's been in previous years and is higher than the two previous uh, most extreme events uh, in 2017 and 2019. You have two more minutes, Mark. Perfect, thank you. You can also use this to look at the long-term change at any location uh, around the world. Um, this is again for Belize showing how the increase in heat stress has uh, been building throughout years and especially in the last five years has been much higher than in the past. And we'll have these comparative graphs. These show the temperatures at each location in the first decade of the record, so 85 through 94, and then the last decade of the record, so in this case uh, um, uh, 2010 through 2019, the last full decade. And what you can see in blue is the temperature diagram from the first decade and in red, the most recent decade. And you see a significant increase in both the mean temperature and in the distribution and, and especially in these warmest temperatures and how long we, the temperatures have been at those high conditions. 
And the reason we're seeing this this year is very concerning because it's not that there's a big El Nino or a big La Nina, but 2020 is just the second warmest year on record without any kind of tropical forcing. So the big concern is the fact that we're seeing such high um, temperatures and such uh, severe bleaching conditions, despite the fact that there is no tropical forcing. Odds are extremely high that we're going to be in the top five warmest years on record this year, and uh, there's still a good chance that we could even end up with the warmest year on record. And the reason for this, of course, is the high carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We're currently at about 415 parts per million, and we can expect these kind of bleaching conditions to keep continuing until we can manage to get CO2 back down to around 350 parts per million. So just to conclude this, uh, the big things to be concerned about right now, for this year, we're looking at uh, a potential of uh, alert level one conditions through most of the Caribbean and alert level two in this band from Eastern Mexico over to Hispaniola. And if you look at what's happened over this, comparing this decade to past decades, you can see the pattern where we have indeed seen an increase in the frequency and intensity of bleaching events because of this warming and that warming is likely to continue for the regional future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Now we are going to continue with the last presentation of this first set uh, with a joint presentation by Anna and Angela. Um, just to remind the participants that you can type in your questions for Ileana and Mark in the chat box. Just make sure it says to all so I don't miss them. So I will introduce my colleagues. Anna Giro is the Healthy Reefs Initiative Country Coordinator for Guatemala. She has been diving and exploring the Guatemalan reefs for the last 16 years, developing the most comprehensive database for corals in the country. In 2014, Anna discovered the Cayman Crown Reef System with local fishermen, which is the most developed reef in Guatemala and one of the jewels of the Mesoamerican Reef region. And Angela Mojica is the co-founder of Pixan Hub, a consulting company working in the Mesoamerican Reef region on marine coastal conservation and sustainability. Angela has more than 15 years of experience working on coral reefs ecological processes, management effectiveness of marine protected areas, environmental economics, and program innovation. Anna and Angela are long-term collaborators, and today they will be talking about the reef health in the Mesoamerican Reef region and the research they are developing in the Cayman Crown Reef in Guatemala, a newly discovered reef system in the Gulf of Honduras with extraordinary features. Thank you, Anna and Angela. Thank you. So, are you able to see my screen well? Yes. yes. Perfect. So the Healthy Reefs Initiative uh, has been doing reef health monitoring in the Mesoamerican Reef since 2006. And we have published the 2008, 2010, 2012, 2015, 2018, and this year, uh, we published the 2020 report card. And so we estimate the, the reef health according to four main indicators, with, which are coral cover, fleshy microalgal cover, herbivorous fish biomass, and commercial fish biomass. With these four indicators, we get the reef health index. So how is the reef health in the Mesoamerican reef? This is data published in our 2020 report card. Uh, I wanted to highlight that this effort is possible thanks to the regional collaboration that we have with partners. So we found that from the 286 sites that we monitored, 16% of the sites are in critical condition, 46% are in poor condition, 29% are in fair condition, 8% are in good, and only 1% um, are in very good condition. So this it gives us an idea that we have uh, the overall reef health index is of 2.5. This is on a scale from 1 to 5. And so you can find all the data in the MAR Data Explorer platform. This platform was jointly developed with Agra. It's a user-friendly tool. You can look at changes on the reef health at specific sites or by subregion as well. Also, this tool lets us compare the reef health index since 2006. 
And with all the years that we've been gathering data on, on the MAR, um, we have found that there are very interesting reefs and we found uh, high coral reefs in, in unexpected places. And I'm gonna show you some, some of these reefs. And basically we have um, Banco Cordelia, which is located in Roatan, Honduras. This site is located between one of the main ports of the island and the airport. And it has a high coral cover of Acropora cervicornis. Uh, we have also uh, Swine Islands in Honduras. This site has uh, big corals. The islands have been heavily impacted by hurricanes because this site is, or the island is located in the, in the paths of the hurricanes. Also, we have Tela in Honduras. So even though the reefs have constant sedimentation and changes in salinity because of high river runoff, the reefs have adapted to the same, you know, this, the same parameters as well as this other site, which are we, we're gonna be talking about uh, further on, which is the Kim and Kram reef site. So we have these two sites that have high sedimentation. And also with our data, I wanted to show uh, two of uh, some major reef builders in the Mar, and one of them is uh, Orbicella. So the Orbicella species uh, we can see the cover uh, by, uh, by uh, this, um, for example, we have the black dots, which we can't really see are 0%, and then we have the yellow dots that are 0 to 10%, and then more than 10% cover. So we sell species have suffered declines due to bleaching and disease in the mar. And here we can see that Turnip in Belize had this site with the highest cover that it's of 18%. And if we focus on size, we can see that the Bay Islands and Honduras have the highest um, size of the corals as well. So we can take a look at that in our data and that how it presents. And I also wanted to talk about another important reef builder uh, that we don't really get to talk about much, but it's Agarisa tenifolia. And this is a major reef builder, especially in the southern, southern part of the Mesoamerican reef in Guatemala and in Honduras as well. And if we are focusing on, on this area, specifically in Guatemala and Tela in Honduras, we can see that we have more than 20% or zero to like 20% coral cover in, in some of the areas. So this is a major reef builder. And this takes us uh, to uh, a site that we wanna highlight, which is the Cayman Crown Reef which is located uh, between Guatemala and, and Honduras. So this is a very special place they, that we have recently uh, found and discovered. And we are doing all of our, our research in this place. And it was found in 2014 with the help of some fishermen. And we're gonna show a, a quick video. So what you're about to see, it's a short video of this beautiful coral reef system. This is our primary study site right now. Cayman Crown has over 60% of live coral cover and it's one of the highest of the Mar region. It is characterized for having complex and diverse geomorphology with different microecosystem, as you're seeing. And we have deep ocean water currents uh, of more than 500 meters, meeting shallow reef ridges uh, at 10 meters. And as you can see, uh, there is a beautiful biodiversity in this site. Anna, can you go to the next one, please? Okay, so our, our scientific work documenting and studying Cayman Crown uh, has supported a different conservation actions and efforts to grant protection. Anna has led uh, high-level presentations at the governmental level. And in May of 2020, we got very good news and protection was granted through a ministerial agreement declaring Cayman Crown as a no-take zone for the next 10 years. Let's go to the next one. Um, besides the coral health evaluation using AGRA that Anna just explained, we also do a coral bleaching emergency response plan. We use the bar drop methodology, which is uh, probably one of the most common methodologies uh, used in the region. Uh, to follow up bleaching events and that allows us to know what are the uh, severity of the impacts to see if corals are pale, pale bleach or bleach and also 
to assess uh, the mortality rates that we see. So combining these two types of monitoring that allows us to have a more integral approach uh, to the health of our reefs. Next. Um, this, is, this is a collaborative effort that is led by Healthy Reefs Initiative and it's carried out with partners in the four countries. And the important thing is that this allows us to have a collaborative network and a quicker response to these bleaching events to know how are our corals doing throughout the Mid-American Reef region. As Mark was showing you, um, the bleaching events throughout the years have increased. This is an example of the last five years where we are highlighting, highlighting the Mesoamerican Reef. Something important to mention here is that um, the impacts of warm water events uh, affect uh, the region differently. Uh, and in the last couple of years, especially 2017 and also 2019, the southern portion of the Mesoamerican Reef was very affected. Uh, and I would like to show you, and I can, can we go to the next one? We wanted to share with you this picture where you can really see the impacts on our study site. Um, you can see the difference between May and October of 2019, and the difference is very significant, how the, the landscape of the reef is looking. Uh, this is a re research in progress. We have not been able to go back since October to monitor uh, and to see how our corals responding due to the pandemic. Uh, but it was really amazing to see the difference. And to give you a, a better understanding of the bleaching record in Cayman Crown in the Guatemalan part, uh, what you can see here is a comparison of the last uh, four years. And what's outstanding is that the affected corals, these include corals that were pale, partially bleached or bleached, they went from 50% in 2016 to 76.8% last year. So the, the impacts are, are pretty significant. You have one more minute, Angela. Thank you. Okay, so if we take a, a closer look at specific data for the site, we can see that the percent of corals that have not been affected, but were fully like bleached, it has been, uh, have risen since 2016. In 2019, for example, we have 38% uh, that were fully bleached, the corals on this particular site. So we've seen the impact on, on 2019. And if we see the temperature records, we can see that there were many months that the temperature were, was over 30. So from almost like four of the six months that we collected the data, uh, we can see this. So as Angela said, we haven't been able to, to go back and retrieve the, the sensors to, to download the rest of the data. So it's an ongoing uh, research still. We are also working with Fabio Cresto, who will be presenting, uh, and he's analyzing the temperature and pH data also uh, a little bit more, you know, about our site. So we're also using phytogrammetry to talk about reef health, and I'm going to be really quick on this one because Craig is going to talk about uh, this more specifically. Uh, so we're just starting to do this, and basically you can use this to track reef health, bleaching, disease, and overall coral health on an area or an, uh, focus on a specific colony. So these 3D images are a great tool to help us see changes over time. And if you see here, for example, we can focus on a specific colony or area on, on the site. So then a call to action for bleaching 2020, as, we, as Mark showed us, um, as he pointed out, we need to prepare and start thinking about bleach watch monitoring for 2020. And even though we have been focusing on bleaching, there are other effects due to climate change, like acidification, for example, which are threatening uh, a global loss of, of coral reef ecosystems. So also we wanted a shout out to that as well to keep in mind. And thank you. Thank you, Anna and Angela. So now before we go uh, with the next two presenters, we have uh, time for questions and answers. So I will read from the chat box. Um, okay, so we have a question from Tao. 
Is there a manual to identify corals and diseases of corals from the Gulf of Mexico? Is it specifically for someone? Or? No, anybody can answer this one. Or the Gulf of Mexico, right? Yes. Um, probably Mark can tell us what is available. Yeah. <laughs> or if it's not available. <laughs> I, I think one of the uh, the best options is uh, there, there are certainly materials available through AGRA. Uh, you know, if we're talking about uh, the Gulf of Mexico, anything from the Gulf and Caribbean region is going to be fairly similar. So um, there are a number of uh, of them out there. Uh, I'd say just do a Google search and, and uh, maybe um, uh, if if you want to do monitoring, certainly the AGRA protocols are, are well established for that area. Okay, thank you, Mark. And also, Mark, in the chat box, share um, how can you submit the bleaching reports? There's a web page there. And also, if you are involved in AGRA, as, as he already told us, you can also write your reports there and they provide the, the data to the Coral Reef Watch. Um, Norma Muñoz, uh, can you give us some more information about cyanobacteria covering some corals in your region or country, please? I don't know to whom this question is directed. So about cyanobacteria, it also when, when we do the agro monitoring and when we do the benthic surveys, we we can collect data on cyanobacteria and how it's affecting our corals as well. Um, I guess that that we're we're also using to see. Okay. And another question from Jain: Do you can provide a field manual for coral identification? So a manual for, for IDs, um, I would also um, send people to, to look into the AGRA, AGRA website and, and the methodology because they have some great resources there for coral ID. Yeah, and you can also check the ID book from Paul Human. Yeah, the book from Paul Human as well. Mm -hmm. And organisms. Okay, there's a comment. We will pass on all the comments. Um, we have a comment from Rama uh, We are carrying out coral reef monitoring studies in the Pak Bay southeast coast of India, just opposite to Gulf of Manar. I have taken underwater videos and photographs of corals, and I have encountered problem in identification of corals using photographs. I, any software is available to identify the corals using underwater videos and photographs. If available, kindly provide that software and also any coral identification manual, and he's providing his email. So anyone from the speakers, if, uh, we will have his email if you wanna share something with him. Um, another question from Jose Isidro. May I know if there are reefs in the region that have fully recovered from bleaching events? If yes, how long was the recovery period? This is not a specific for anyone. So the recovery period from the from corals. Um, well, what we've seen, for example, in the in the past, um, when we have the bleaching, like at the end of, of the year, we've seen that corals might, you know, they they recover, not totally, but some do recover, like by let's see, like by April when we've come back, or May when we've come back to to monitor the reefs as well. I don't know if Mark has some more specifics on, on what you've seen. 
Well, more broadly, when you're looking at bleaching events that have occurred in the Caribbean, you know, you're talking about two different things. One, if the corals have only bleached, then there is the poten potential for those corals to get their algae back. Um, but when you're dealing with the severe events and there's been a lot of mortality, the, there aren't a lot of sites in the Caribbean that have recovered uh, a great deal from major mortality events. Um, uh, the, the levels of, uh, of coral cover tends to stay pretty low uh, after these big bleaching events because there are just so many other stressors in place. There's some notable exceptions and it's great to see those locations, but uh, um, yeah, I, it really is going to be dependent from place to place uh, but the uh, bleaching and, and mortality has been very long lasting. Yes, maybe, maybe I will add that the, there are some organizations in the Mar region working on coral restoration and they are specifically focusing on heat tolerant species. Um, like the work that Lisa Carney is doing in Belize. So there are some places where it seems some, some specific species or varieties of the species are, are, are um, having a, a better capacity to recover, but it, I, I would say it really depends on the year and what Mark was saying, how long the event is. Thank you all. So the next question from Richard Suko. Where can he find the methodology for the bleach watch assessments that was previously mentioned? We can, we can for sure send a, along with the recording of the, of the webinar, uh, the complete citation. Uh, it is online. Uh, I don't remember right now the citation. I had it on the slide, but uh, we can provide that so that you can download it. It's free access. Thank and you. I did paste the uh, uh, URL for the AGRA training tools uh, in the chat box. Yes, thank you. And also you can see in your screen the emails of each of the speakers. So you can also write them directly. Another question for Anna from Robbie Smith. How large is the Cayman Crown MPA? So the, the declaration is uh, 200 kilometers squared. Um, that's the area that there was declared um, a fully no-take zone. Uh, we've been mapping the, the, the reef and, and part of it wasn't included into the, into the no-take zone because it overlaps with an existing MPA. And here in Guatemala, it's a little bit difficult to the process of the legislating this part. So we're still working on, on that area that, that wasn't you know, fully, fully declared a no-take zone. So the area, the, the Cayman Crown Reef is larger than this, but what was declared was 200 kilometers squared. Yeah, and there is also a portion of the reef system that is on the Belizean site, just to keep in mind. Thank you, Angela and uh, Anna. So another question for Mark from Morgan. Do we know how long a coral can be bleached for until recovery survival is not possible? I'm sure this varies by species, but wondering if there's a general timeline for survival. You know, that's a very interesting question because we used to think that it was really just a matter of a, a few months. But what we saw during the severe bleaching in the Caribbean in 2005 is there were some corals that completely bleached, and you know, especially large, massive corals. Um, uh, Orbicellas and uh, some of the uh, Diploria, Pseudodiploria spe type species, that um, the, the bleach completely and stayed that way for, for several months to even up to a year. Um, it's, it's something that we hadn't expected to see. Um, but typically for most corals, um, they'll either recover or die within uh, weeks to months. Okay, thank you, Mark. Another question for Anna from Davitia James. What software, what software do you use for reef photogrammetry? Is a description of a method available anywhere? Yeah, so we're using the Agisoft PhotoScan program. And yes, there are, there are some methods available that we can also help share. Um, 
Craig is going to be talking more about this, so, so keep tuned. <laughs> okay, and Anna, I think this one is also for you from Leo. How easy is it to develop a reef health index? How often do the reefs have to be monitored in a year to come up with the index? So yeah, this, this was developed um, some years back before we did the first report card on, on the Mesoamerican Reef. Um, so there are established threshold values that applies to the Mesoamerican Reef. Um, and it was you know, a group of scientists that came together and put this threshold values as well. Uh, with all the data that has been, you know, previously recorded, and and this is the way that the reef health index was developed. So it depends on on where you're at, and in the Caribbean, for example. Um, and I think Craig is going to talk about this. But for example, in Bahamas, they have a different threshold values just for the commercial fish because they have a, a higher a biomass of of groupers than we do. So we have to adapt for for specific spe uh, specific areas as well. Thank you, Anna. There's a question from Phil Karp, and this is not specific for any of the speakers, so whoever wants to answer. Is there, is there any notable difference in degree of bleaching between natural reefs and restored reefs? That's, a, that's an interesting question. We've mm -hmm. uh, seen evidence from some of the uh, restoration programs that the corals that uh, have been used, especially the acroporas that have been used in, uh, uh, in nurseries, grown up in nurseries and then put out and grown on reefs may be a bit more resistant to bleaching. Whether that's because they've selected individuals or uh, phenotypes that are, are more resistant or whether it has to do with the handling, we're really not sure. Um, but even that has its limits because some of the severe bleaching events we've seen have wiped out um, uh, reefs that have, have uh, been restored uh, as well as the ones that are natural. Thank you, Mark. Another question for you, so hold on in there, <laughs> from Israel Muñiz. The new coral reef multi-year plots, uh, do you plan to apply this at a sub-regional level, for example, Cozumel only? or will it only be applied at a country level, all of the Mexican Caribbean? Uh, he says the new multi-year plots are excellent. Yeah, thanks. The, uh, they're going to be at the same level as our current regional virtual stations. Uh, so it's in between those two in most cases. So uh, I put a, a link in to the regional virtual stations on the chat. Um, and so the example there is Cozumel Falls within Quintana Roo. And so that would be where that one would be found. So they'll be sort of at that level. Uh, if you have particular needs, we can work with you on, uh, on analyses at other, other levels. But uh, we have 200 and some odd uh, regional virtual stations around the world. And we're pulling together all of those graphics and uh, analyses for, for all of those. Thank you, Mark, for sharing those links in the chat box. And one last question. Um, uh, he or she, because it doesn't have a name. Um, I can see high, high living coral cover of Atunifolia. Do you consider it a new framework building coral species or not? So, so in my talk, I talk about about this. So it's not a it's a, a framework building. It is definitely an important framework building for for so for areas. For example, in our reefs, we have Atunifolia that are very important and are, you know, our major framework builders here. So they are, um, you know, they are considered a framework building species. Yes, and, and for some regions in, in Guatemala and Honduras, what we have seen is that uh, somehow they, they have been, they are better adapted for the local conditions. This includes um, freshwater input, uh, more sedimentation, and they still do pretty good. Thank you, Angela and Anna. So this one was the last question for this uh, first set of presentations. So we will continue with our last two speakers. And uh, I will introduce the first one, Fabio Cresto Alena. He's a climate expert and the founder of Rook Amal. He has worked on climate change impacts on terrestrial ecosystems in different research institutes across Europe. 
In January 2020, he moved to Guatemala, where he collaborates with WWF Central America and other organizations to understand and mitigate the impacts of climate change on coastal ecosystems. Fabio will talk about investigating climate change impacts on endangered ecosystems from the Arctic and the Amazon to coral reefs. Thank you, Fabio. We can see your screen now. Perfect. Thank you. So thank you for the opportunity and I'm really happy to be here. So exactly today I'm gonna talk about also not only coral reef but actually my experience in working on climate change impacts on different terrestrial ecosystems and on how this experience can be used to understand the impacts on uh, the uh, coral reef, in particular Cayman Crown coral reef. So this is the outline of what I'm going to talk about today. I will start with the Arctic, then we will move to the Amazon, and then finally we will arrive uh, to the coral reefs. So I will start with this map, which is a map of the tipping points in the climate systems made by uh, Shell Nuba in 2009 in PNAS. So, uh, what is a tipping point? A tipping point is an element of a system which displays a kind of a threshold behavior. That means that um, just with small perturbation, it can completely change its state, um, effectively uh, changing to a different uh, to different behavior. For example, um, we have the boil forest, and why do we why do we care about it? Well, because all three. Uh, tragically, all three ecosystems I'm going to talk about today appear in this map. So we have the Arctic here, uh, which can shift from a tundra to a taiga-like ecosystem. We have the Amazon rainforest, which can shift to a savanna-like state, and the tropical coral reefs, as uh, Mark and Anne and Hagel already um, talked about. So uh, let's start again with the uh, climate change impacts on Arctic ecosystems. Well, normally when one thinks about the Arctic, uh, maybe you saw it in the news, one can think about these huge wildfires which are ravaging the uh, tundra in Siberia. And they are extremely hard to stop because there are not so many people living in these environments. And also these ecosystems didn't evolve to face such high temperature. Um, and therefore they are extremely tragic because they are destroying a lot of uh, tundra and they also destabilizing the huge amount of carbon that is stored in these ecosystems. One can also think about these enormous holes that are appearing right now across uh, the Arctic, mainly in Siberia. These are people, to give you a reference, um, and they are called methane bomb because um, they come from the uh, phase transition of the liquid methane, which is stored sometimes in the soil because of the really low temperature of the soil, um, that because of the general increase in temperature because of climate change, changes phase and literally explodes and leaves these enormous holes here in, in the soil. Other impacts derived simply by the degradation of the soil. The uh, frozen soil in the Arctic is called permafrost. And if permafrost thaws because of the uh, increase in temperature, well, also the building which are built on top of it collapse. And this is a farm in Alaska, but in Siberia there are whole cities and airports which are collapsing every soon. Basically, as we speak, every summer we have these, these events. Another event, uh, another impact of climate change in the Arctic, which is not as uh, dramatic in the images as you can see, but it's extremely dangerous for the local ecosystem, is the greening or the increase in uh, ecosystem productivity that uh, actually is a global phenomenon. There are studies that show that over the past 30 years, all terrestrial ecosystems basically um, display this increased uh, productivity. And this is extremely dangerous for the Arctic because the Arctic is not productive at all. Actually, it's made of species which are adapted to live in extremely low temperature and extremely long winters. So basically they are actively being substituted by more productive ecosystems like the uh, taiga or the boreal forest in general. And it, this is an image of a study that we made with colleagues uh, from the European uh, Commission. And we showed that the main driver uh, for the Arctic of 
this localized greening is the CO2, so the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, which is basically food for the plants and uh, this drives this increase in productivity in the, in the Arctic ecosystems. So let's move to warmer climates, to the Amazon forest. And um, okay, even in the Amazon forest, we have this kind of greening because even here, plants are getting more food if there is more CO2 in the atmosphere. So theoretically, one would think that we would see your, um, a change, a positive change, an increase in the carbon stored in, the, in, the, in this ecosystem, in the biomass. Well, actually, it's not what, what, is we, what we see at all. We see an increase in productivity, but we see a decrease in the biomass. And why is it happening? Um, the answer is actually that we are seeing a dramatic increase in tree mortality. And I'm just talking about natural tree mortality and leaving the deforestation completely out of it. And this is because of increase in um, dry spells, for example, due to climate change, the increase in uh, insect outbreaks or general uh, perturbations like wildfires or uh, storms. And this phenomenon is actually driving uh, a shift, a change in the species composition of the whole forest. Um, the, fragile equilibrium uh, between pioneer trees and secondary trees, which the forest evolved during the past millennia, is shifting, is changing towards pioneer trees, which are trees that can um, colonize uh, open spaces quite fast, they grow very fast, and they um, also die very fast. They're not very tolerant to perturbation and they store less carbon than the secondary trees, which are actually what we think about when we think about um, an equilibrium forest. So they are big trees which, are, uh, which grow slower, but they can store a lot of carbon and they're much more hard to kill. Um, so this kind of shift in, uh, in species composition is actually what we see also in other ecosystems, like for example, the coral reef in which um, we see the uh, change in species composition, two species um, which can, be, can tolerate the new climate towards which, uh, towards which we are basically moving in the future. And this brings me to my last point in this presentation, which is investigating climate change impacts on coral reefs. So um, as uh, Angela and Dana mentioned, I moved to Guatemala uh, and I started to collaborate with them on this, this amazing data set that they are uh, taking up from the Cayman Crown Coral Reef. So we decided to write a proposal to apply the same methods and models that, we, that I developed as a climate scientist, as a climate modeler uh, for terrestrial ecosystems on the analysis of these time series that they are um, measuring from 4pH and temperature. Sadly, we just got the first five months, but they are really high resolution data, which provide a lot of, uh, a large amount of data uh, each 10 minutes. And uh, this is just really the first look at the data with the temperature on the y axis and the pH on the x. We can see generally um, a consistent increase in pH uh, during the, these five months between May and October 2019. And as um, Anna mentioned, extremely high temperature, well over uh, 30 degrees. The idea uh, of this project, which is called Cayman Extreme Project and is founded by the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, uh, and I'm doing uh, in collaboration with Anna and Angela, is the inve investigation of the impacts of weather extremes and other drivers also on the temperature and pH measured in, uh, in Cayman Crown. The idea is to um, basically do a, throughout a, an analysis uh, of the measured variable and measured variables and maybe also to develop a, a forecast for the measured time series. So I want to conclude with this slide again, so the tipping point in the climate system, just to um, get the message, to, to uh, reiterate the message that if we have one tipping point in one part of the world, for example, in this case, the coral reef, this is going to have a huge impact on many other tipping points on the, in the rest of the world. So um, we are going towards a state of the system that we don't know about, um, and we have to stop. We have to change and we have to do all we can, all, all in our power to, to stop this 
tipping from happening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabio. That was very interesting. Now we are going to our last presentation from Craig Dahlgren. He is the executive, executive director of the Perry Institute for Marine Science. He has worked on mangrove and coral reef ecosystems, efficacy of marine protected areas, and population dynamics of fishery species ranging from traditional Caribbean fishery species like Nassau grouper and Caribbean spiny lobster to emerging fisheries like sea cucumbers, parrotfish, sponges, and gorgonians. This work has led to dozens of peer-reviewed publications and has influenced marine resource management and policy in the Bahamas, Mesoamerican Reef, and throughout the wider Caribbean region. He will talk about the Bahamas wide agra data set and spatial and temporal variability in bleaching, a more in-depth study of a thermally tolerant reef, and photogrammetry as a tool for monitoring at the reef level and individual coral level. The title of his presentation is Coral Reefs and Climate Change in the Bahamas. Thank you, Craig, and welcome. Okay, um, thanks for that introduction. And that pretty much sums up what I'm gonna try to touch on uh, in the 10 minutes that I have and can follow up in more detail on some of the question and answer session. Um, so just to, to take a break from Mesoamerican Reef and go to the Bahamas, uh, the Bahamas is very vulnerable to temperature stress. Um, in a lot of ways. It's at the far northern end of the Caribbean region, um, so it sees a lot of seasonal temperature fluctuations. Uh, there's large latitudinal gradients, so what's happening in one part of the country may be very different from happening in an, another part of the country. And then we also have these big shallow bank areas in the Bahamas, and where that comes into play is that these uh, deeper water areas out here in the ocean are more thermally buffered. They don't change temperature as much as these shallow areas that take on air temperature. So in the winter, these areas get very cold. In the summer, they get very hot. And as a result, we have a, a real range of reefs in the Bahamas as far as their tolerance to temperature stress. Um, there's high variability between sites. And within some sites, we do see annual temperature fluctuations going from below 20 degrees Celsius to above 32 degrees Celsius in a single year. Um, so these reefs are subject to a lot of temperature stress that other parts of the region might not be. Um, we've been doing agri surveys uh, throughout the Bahamas and sort of copying on the Mesoamerican reef model developed coral reef report cards. Um, this is from the latest coral reef report card where we have looked at 250 or so assessments of reefs throughout much of the Bahamas um, over the past five years, including a number that we surveyed repeatedly. And just to summarize what we've been finding when we aggregate this data with respect to coral bleaching and temperature stress, we see a number of things here. The, the blue bars in this graph are surveys that were conducted January to July, so cold months as temperatures are warming, and then the orange when temperatures are at their peak and falling. And what we see is that um, there's definitely some seasonal variability where the later year period after peak temperatures, we have a lot greater uh, proportion of corals bleached. Um, on average for years, it's been uh, between 15 and 25 percent of all corals surveyed that we had bleached during this time. Um, so a significant number of corals were bleached uh, annually. Uh, we also see in events like Mark described in 2015 where we have a major mass bleaching event, we saw close to 70 percent of corals during that uh, August to December time window bleached. And that bleaching did hold over a little bit into the next year based on elevated levels of bleach corals in the following January to July. So we do have these extreme events, but they vary spatially throughout the Bahamas. Um, this is showing the percent of corals bleached on Andros Island in uh, November 2015. Um, Andros is right here. And Abaco, Great Abaco Island in the southern part 
which was surveyed at the end of October 2015. And we see some differences here. On Andros, about half of the reefs surveyed had more than 75% of their corals bleached. Um, and in two cases, it was over 95% of the corals were bleached across all species. Um, on Abaco, in contrast, we did see elevated bleaching levels. And this photo here is actually from Abaco. But what we were seeing was generally in the 40 to 50% of all corals were bleached. And only one reef saw more than 50% coral bleaching. So we do see this kind of spatial variability. And we see this on a very fine scale. And I'm going to take us into this part of Abaco for this next little case study we did on a couple of reefs there looking at their thermal tolerance. And these reefs, uh, Mermaid Reef up at the top and Sandy Key Reef at the bottom, are in central Abaco. They're about eight kilometers apart from each other, similar depth, similar species composition in that depth zone. Um, but we see that they had very different temperature conditions in 2015 and very different responses to those temperature conditions in 2015. So to go to Mermaid Reef first, what we see is that this is the temperature from May to October um, in 2015. And really from sometime in June till sometime mid-September, the temperatures at Mermaid Reef were we're kind of off the charts, um, a lot more than we expected, about two degrees on average warmer than Sandy Key Reef. And across this entire time period, about 18% of the time, the reefs were above 32 degrees Celsius. Um, and just as an aside, this is also a reef that gets down below 20 degrees in the winter sometimes. So it sees real extreme conditions. Um, but in 2015, in spite of these high temperature stress conditions, uh, this is a picture of the way the reef looks normally. This is in October 2015. We really didn't see any evidence of bleaching there. Maybe some corals got a slightly pale, but really nothing noticeable. Sandy Key Reef, on the other hand, which didn't see as high temperatures, still saw very high temperatures, but only got up to 32 degrees for a one or two um, units of measure. We saw wide scale bleaching in October 2015. Um, not just this big Orbicella head, but uh, you can see some of the smaller corals around it. It was, uh, I think, around 70% bleached um, in this case. So what is going on here? Why does one reef that sees the highest temperatures we've seen in the Bahamas not bleach and one that sees high but not as high temperatures bleach? Well, to address that, we looked at the genetics of the coral host site, uh, coral, coral host colonies. We looked at the zooxanthellae and we looked at the microbiome more broadly. And what we found was that mermaid reef across a 40, meter by 40 meter area, all the corals that we sampled were of a single genotype um, versus Sandy Key Reef where all the corals we sampled in a similar area were unique genotypes except for one clone of each other. So it might be that this genotype was uniquely adapted to handle this extreme temperature stress. Um, what we also found though when we were looking at the zooxanthellae was that on Mermaid Reef, all of the zooxanthellae were in the genus Durastinium, one of the more thermally tolerant zooxanthellae. Uh, whereas on Sandy Key Reef, there was a higher degree of variability in the zooxanthellae uh, within each coral colony. So it seems that there's a, a combination here of coral genotype potentially and also the zooxanthellae that make Mermaid Reef unique and able to tolerate these extreme temperatures. Um, as an aside, we also looked at the microbiome and saw that in contrast, the, the microbiome at Mermaid Reef, the microbes associated with it, uh, were more diverse than Sandy Key. So we're not quite sure how the microbial community can influence uh, stress tolerance in corals, but uh, it might be that there were microbes here that were present that promoted survival of the coral under these conditions versus the Sandy Key Reef where those might have been absent. 
Um, so now we're starting. I'm sorry? You have two more minutes. Okay. I will move on from this then and talk about photogrammetry. So what our studies are showing us is that it's important to look at things at the reef scale, and it's also important to, to look at things at the individual scale. And the way that we're doing this moving forward is through photogrammetry, where we can look at whole reef analysis, and we can also monitor the fate of individual corals that may or may not bleach and look at their growth and survival over time using uh, two-dimensional orthomosaics like this photo here and 3D models. And this is a reef off of northern Abaco after Hurricane Dorian um, where it saw severe bleaching. And we can zoom in on this uh, orthomosaic image. And this is a, a scale bar here is a half meter long. We can look at uh, fate track individual coral colonies. We can look at differences in bleaching across different species or individual colonies. And if we zoom in a little closer to these different areas, we can see even within a colony how bleaching may vary and be able to track that colony over time by repeated photographic uh, expeditions to that site. And this is here just showing that we can get down to the five to 10 centimeter range very easily. We can even get down to one centimeter with the high resolution cameras that we're using um, to look and see which corals are bleaching, which ones aren't and track them over time. Now this, in the last couple seconds I have, is a very useful tool using the 2D imagery, but in some of these cases with a big coral head like this, most of the surface area is on the side. So we really need to use 3D models to look at that. And this is just a quick animation of that reef looking at it in 3D. Um, and you can see how much of more surface area we can sample with these 3D models. And we can zoom in on individual coral colonies and take measurements. And then just to show a little more, this is um, when we were taking the video, I'm sorry, the photo imagery, showing the size of that colony and how we can develop the, the 3D model based on that, um, removing the effects of water to really get a better quality image than, than what we can see underwater at times. And I will stop there. Um, we do have a lot more information up on our website and other things, and I can answer questions related to that too. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. So now we have some time uh, for questions for these last uh, two presenters. Uh, I see one question from Miguel Antonio. Will the recording of this meeting be distributed among the assistants? Yes, it will be distributed and also you will find it in the AGRA website and also in the YouTube channel of the Healthy Reefs or Healthy People Initiative. Um, Judith Lang says, uh, Fabio, thank you for the strong statement that we need to start doing whatever we can to stop the carnage that global warming is causing and that all ecosystems are connected in this tragedy that our actions are collectively making. The information that we record as reefs demise isn't sufficient to save them. We urgently have to reduce our own carbon diets and convince others to do the same. Um, I have a question from Morgan, and this one is for you, Craig. Good news about the bleaching resistance, but are you concerned about the lack of genotypic diversity at Mermaid Reef as it relates to responding to different stressors other than temperature? Also, what are the typical patterns of genotypic diversity throughout the Bahamas, more like Mermaid or Sandy Key? So in general, it's more like Sandy Key for most species of corals. There are some of the more rare, more endangered species, the Acroporas, that we uh, see very limited genetic diversity, but most reefs have much higher genetic diversity, uh, similar to Sandy Key Reef. Um, the lack of genetic diversity at Mermaid Reef is a, a big concern. Um, that reef uh, is doing okay, but um, there's very little reproductive output from that reef because of it. Uh, we're looking to do larval propagation, crossing that reef with other ones and increase genetic diversity. But we've tried some outplanting of corals to that reef um, and they just don't survive there. So that really is unique in terms of uh, 
the ability of the corals there to, to survive that kind of temperature range. Thank you, Craig. And we have one more question for you from Israel Muniz. Uh, the difference in symbiont genotypes found between mermaid and sandy key may have been caused by some ecological filtering based on previous events. For example, it is possible that mermaid has been constantly exposed to the past and therefore present, present that differentiation. To what do you attribute this remarkable difference in some in symbionts? Yeah, I do think it, it probably is related to, to past events. And just with mermaid subject to these chronic annual stresses with temperature fluctuations, um, it's probably been a selective process with uh, the Durastinium being the only symbionts that really are, are able to, to tolerate there and survive. Okay, um, some questions. Okay, uh, this is from Patricia Kramer for Fabio. For the Arctic and Amazon habitats, have you seen any type of Arctic and Amazon habitats that are more thermally tolerant, similar to some of the reefs that Craig talked about? Yes, so in the Amazon, there are species. In that case, the, the, the increasing temperature is not the problem, it's more the increase in dry spells and in disturbance. So species which are more prone to uh, not die for carbon starvation or generally um, um, because of what, lack of water can survive better than other species that evolved to, to, to live in a, in a always humid ecosystems. Uh, ecosystem and in the Arctic um, is strange because uh, we see, so we have observations, for example, in Alaska and in Siberia. Yeah? And um, sometimes, even though the climate is really similar, uh, the response of the Alaskan permafrost, for example, or to degradation is much uh, stronger and it's um, much faster than what we see in, in Siberia. Yeah? It's not really clear why, it's probably, um, uh, a question of interconnectivity of ecosystem, but there is not uh, a unique answer to that. It's a great question, Patricia. Thank you, Fabio. Um, we have one more question for Craig uh, from Kitty Courier. What metrics do you use that take advantage of the 3D or 2.5D surface models generated through photogrammetry? Yeah, so for the 3D or 2.5D models, um, we can look at uh, volumetric analyses of the coral. We can look at rugosity on a reef scale. Um, and then also looking at complete surface area, not just planar view the way we would do in an agri survey or using an ortho mosaic. We can look at complete surface area to look at percent cover of live tissue or tissue uh, change in tissue, whether it's lost because of disease or bleaching. Um, those are the main things we're using for the 3D imagery right now. Okay, thank you. And there's a general question anyone can answer from Tari Lopez. How does climate change affect the interaction between corals and algae? What strategies we can use to regulate a change in these ecosystems? I can say, speaking from the Bahamas point of view, what we've been seeing really since 1998, the first big mass bleaching events, um, the die-off in, in coral cover has led to increases in algae, um, particularly Microdictyon and other species. So corals haven't been able to, to regain a foothold in most places unless there's high grazing rate. So I think really the, the bleaching event kind of opens up space where algae has the competitive advantage and can, can hold that space and corals are struggling to, to get any of it back. Thank you, Craig. Um, Jorge is asking for a link when they when he can find latest reports about the state of the Mesoamerican Reef. I'm going to share the link right now, and also the spread of the White Syndrome. I'm also going to send. Well, Patricia already shared those links. Thank you, Patricia. And also a question from Jose Isidro. Does a reduced genotypic diversity in a reef reflect a shift in coral community assemblage due to the previous perturbations? Can you read that again? I'm sorry. 
Yes, uh, does a reduced genotypic diversity in a reef reflect a shift in coral community assemblage due to the previous perturbations? Um, I, I'm not sure if it reflects a, a narrowing in genetic diversity due to the previous perturbations or just the failure for new individuals to recruit and survive there. Um, we haven't done that sort of analysis yet to um, see where the bottleneck might have occurred. Okay. Well, I think all of those are the questions we had. I don't know if any of the speakers uh, want to share something else before we close this webinar. I just want to say thank you to everybody. And um, if there are any questions, you can follow up with me um, as well. Yeah. Well, and for me, thank you for the opportunity and for the great talks. Uh, thank you all for the attention. And uh, my email is there. I'm really happy to answer any question or also to get any input on the new project we have with uh, Anna and Angela. We are very excited. And uh, yeah. Thank you. And my thanks as well. Um, this has been a great uh, opportunity. The uh, organizers did a great job pulling this together and we had a, up to 100 participants on here. Uh, if you wanna keep track of what's going on with bleaching, just uh, watch coralreefwatch.noaa.gov. Thank, Thank you. you. So I want to thank all the speakers for sharing their expertise on such important theme as climate change and coral reefs in the Caribbean and Mesoamerican reef region. And also thank you for all the participants for your interest and for staying till the end. We had a full room from different parts of the world. Um, so remember to uh, contact your favorite speaker for any questions. And also you have all the links uh, to some materials in the chat box. And this webinar will be available for all the participants. And also you will be able to share from our YouTube channel, from the Healthy Reefs Initiative and from the Agra web page. So thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you.